Good afternoon, boa tarde, bem-vindos, welcome to this timely conversation, Pandemics and Chaos, Where to Next Brazil. My name is João Biel, I teach medical anthropology here at Princeton University, where I direct the Brazil Lab at the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies, which is hosting this event. I have here with my colleague, the economist Tomás Fujiwara, who works on development and political economy and is the associate director of the Brazil Lab. Tomás will help moderate the conversation. We are grateful to the program in Latin American Studies, the Department of Anthropology, the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, and the Instituto de Estudos para Políticas de Saúde for their co-sponsorship. The new coronavirus pandemic has thrown our world into an unprecedented crisis that highlights chronic limitations in systems of preparedness, response, and social protection, and exposes deeply entrenched inequalities. The pandemic has also been dangerously politicized amid the curtailing of rights, the search for magic bullets, and the brutal disregard for human lives. No world leader has been more vocal in downplaying the threat of COVID-19 than the Brazilian president, Jair Bolsonaro. With an uncontrolled surge of cases, Brazil has rapidly become one of the pandemic's hotspots, raising concerns among neighboring countries and even threats from the US to impose travel restrictions on and from Brazil. With almost 115,000 confirmed COVID-19 cases and about 8,000 confirmed deaths, which are likely an understatement given the lack of testing, the country is gearing toward a full-blown public health emergency and an economic meltdown. President, President Bolsonaro has managed to add a third ingredient to this toxic mix, political crisis, sparked by the recent departure from the government of the Minister of Justice, Sergio Moro, the famed anti-corruption crusader. Moro's allegations that the president was interfering with police affairs has led the Supreme Court to authorize investigations. In the meantime, the military are gaining an ever larger presence on all governmental fronts and traditional political groups keep negotiating their interests in a divided Congress. Amid this pandemic tragedy, we are here to ask where to next Brazil. We are delighted to welcome to this Brazil Lab online event, Arminio Fraga and Angela Alonso, who were the lab's first guest speakers back in September 2018, when the country was formalizing its present day authoritarian turn. Joining them, we have the remarkable Alessandro Rufino, who was one of the lab's last guest speakers before the university went online due to the pandemic. Arminio Fraga is an economist and founding partner of Gavi Investments. Arminio presided over the cent Brazilian Central Bank and is the founder of the Institute for Health Policy Studies. Angela Alonso is professor of sociology at the University of Sao Paulo and former director of SEBRAP, the Brazilian Center of Analysis and Planning. Angela studies the interface of culture and political action and emergent forms of social mobilization in Brazil. Alessandro Rufino is the co-founder and executive director of NOSAS, a laboratory of activism and civic participation. A fellow of the Obama Foundation, Alessandra is also the director of Greg News, HBO's comedy news show in Brazil. Let's give our warmest welcome to this outstanding group of publicly engaged intellectuals. We are looking forward to probing Brazil's ailing present with them and we know that hope is hard to come by these days, but we also want to try to elicit from them their biases for hope, as the luminous Albert Hirschman would have it. As we seek to navigate the surreal times, we all need the critical thinking and horizon-making capacity that Arminio, Angela, and Alessandra have been sponsoring through their powerful public works. Our format today is the following. Tomás and I will ask a first set of questions to Angela, Arminio, and Alessandra in this order. Our speakers will then build on each other's comments and discuss among themselves. 
We will conclude with a final question to our distinguished panelists on what might lie ahead. So Angela, could you please uh, get us started, start our conversation, giving us a brief overview of the political landscape in Brazil, given the turmoil of the last few weeks? How do you read the current political moment and what scenarios do you see unfolding in the near future? Well, first I'd like to, to thank you, all of you from Brazil Center. It's uh, a pleasure to, to be here today. And it's also a pity to be far away from you guys, but, um, and, and also to be here to discuss a uh, catastrophe. But I'm happy to be here with uh, Arminio and Alessandra as well. So I'd like to highlight four um, dimensions of this current political crisis in Brazil. And the first one is about the crisis itself. As, as Juan pointed right now, we are living in a, an excep exceptional unpredictability right now. So we are living overlap the crisis, the COVID, the economics, and the political crisis. In this uh, situation, the usual strategies are no longer good enough to orient the political actors. The president does not run the government and attacks other powers, leaders, and last but not least, civilians. State governors, the Supreme Court, the legislative, and the army are taking spaces that the president left empty. So Bolsonaro then reacts to them with new authoritarian uh, attacks. All sides are walking on the edge or even beyond their jurisdictions. Rules, alliances, and goals are being tested and negotiated at each new move. So political actors are surprising each other with unprecedented actions. So there are no reliable guidelines to anticipate or calculate strategies. So to sum up, the Brazilian politics is a blind game right now. My second point is that society is divided in answering to the crisis. Uh, in the last decade, the anti-state rhetoric is spread out in this. Those who believe in civil society's protagonism argue organized citizens, firms, and NGOs provide better goods, services, and even policies than the state. Accordingly, they have been now donating resources and services to face COVID. Others believe in self-interest. So for them, the animal spirit, not the state, should run society. And in accordance, they are avoiding masks and social distancing. And in their Darwinist struggle for life, Winners have goods, masks, and social uh, resources like ERs, and the usual losers lose again, in, including their own lives. So Brazilian society is split between solidarity and self-interest. As for protests, the, the left lacks a unifying rhetoric and coordination. And since it has been science-oriented, it is only protesting at the windows. On the other side, liberal and conservative movements are abandoning Bolsonaro. But the authoritarian movements remain with him, demonstrating in the streets. And they have spread after Moro left the government but they are still rooted in 50% of the, the, the president's supporters and in a bunch of elite members who see him as a leader. So uh, I'd like to, 
to stress that while no one votes for civic activists and social movements, people voted for Bolsonaro. And my third point is that renovation of politics campaign uh, faces a dead end. The critics to professional politics produced Bolsonaro's election. On the other hand, the ones playing a lead, a lead role now are precisely professional politicians like João Doria and Rodrigo Maia. And leftist leaders are outnumbered. Most of them, like Ciro Gomes, are unable to modernize their speed. And there is no unifying leader Lula did not retook his protagonism. So the left is divided into factions and egos. And my last point is the anti-state rhetorics is facing its practical impossibility. The response to the medical emergency is coming from the welfare state built since the 1980 constitution, the public policy system and SUS, our universal health system. So civic activism is unable to provide in the same scale. The state still is the main player in the redistribution of resources and opportunities. And it is the state that must act now and quickly since the pandemic stands to worsen our key problem, inequality. All the numbers are showing the disease is punishing more than usually punished by Brazilian social structure. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for this, you know, probing and, um, and uh, yeah, probing and, you know, picture and panorama that we want to, to keep discussing as with the other panelists. And I think, Tomás, you want to, to kick in now, right? Yes, uh, so yeah, so thanks everyone for participating and thanks for everyone watching. So uh, I just want to follow up, uh, like moving from the, the politics uh, background to the uh, to the economic background here, asking a question to Arminio. So uh, in your in a recent column you wrote for the Brazilian paper newspaper uh, Folha de São Paulo, you mentioned that Brazil is going through like a perfect storm of a health, economic, and a political crisis at the same time. And that the country is going through the most challenging moment that you have ever witnessed it in a few decades of you know, public service in the company in Brazil. Uh, so Brazil was already experiencing low GDP growth, about 1% in 2019, like an optimistic forecast to be a recession of 3 and 4% for 2020. Uh, so my question, it's a two-pronged question actually, is where do you see the Brazilian economy going and what policies should be pursuing uh, right now to to mitigate the, 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 these challenges. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I echo uh, Angela's words, good to be here, good to be together, even if uh, remotely and uh, not so good to be uh, where we are in Brazil, I guess in the planet. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll start where you were left it, uh, Tomás. Uh, it is indeed uh, a, a gigantic challenge exactly because it has three dimensions and each one in, in and of itself is uh, a major challenge. And then when you add them up, um, it's, it's very daunting, I must say. You know, I've been studying this forever since my Princeton days and I've been a practitioner, I've taught it. So it's not just the vast experience we have here in Brazil, but it's, it's also based on my reading of history, this is indeed a big one and a very difficult one. The backdrop is exactly the one uh, you pointed out. Uh, prior to the crisis, Brazil was in this very frustrating state of secular, unequal stagnation. We know from Larry Summers that this hypothesis of secular stagnation applied to uh, the more mature economies, I think that is the case with us with this uh, proviso. Um, the state in Brazil is almost bankrupt, um, combination of things. Um, 
investment here has collapsed. It's the lowest it's ever been. And, and please note, I'm not talking about the stock market or foreign investors. I'm talking actual capacity building in Brazil is the lowest ever, I believe. And state investment is approaching zero, um, which is crazy. Um, there are a lot of things that the private sector cannot do. And um, so this is a very extreme situation. And unemployment is very high and rising. And has been. We, we went through a very deep recession starting in, in 2014. Uh, there was a 7% decline in GDP, almost 10% per capita. And we really never fully have recovered. So unemployment is high and rising. And I think also it helps to keep in mind that over half of our workforce is either unemployed or in the informal sector. So they also don't have quite, uh, they have very little access to, to support, to social uh, support. Now the health shock itself is, is, is massive and it's unlike anything we've seen in, in decades of economic crisis. We're used to the, the usual pattern has to do with um, the business cycle, with finance, and we, we sort of know what to do about it. This is different. This is a situation where a lot of people are prevented from working, either because of a, of a command from the, the government or because they just want to stay healthy. I think that sometimes is left out of the discussion. Many have no option, no choice. Um, and those are, of course, the ones that are going to uh, suffer in, in, in larger numbers. Um, and this uh, means we're, we're, we're about to see uh, a very, very substantial decline in, in GDP. There are some signs uh, that uh, people are responding. This might be a slight bit of hope despite what they're hearing from Brasilia. Uh, I give you an example here from Rio. Uh, in Rio, the slums have every weekend, the so-called baile funky, the funk balls or dances. And they, they haven't been happening for weeks now. So the, the, the slum leadership said none of that. Um, Yesterday, I got a note from someone um, I know who lives in Rocinha, a very large slum near uh, where I live. And I, I will quote, he, he's a plumber and he, and he does odd, odd jobs on weekends. He's a very hardworking uh, survivor. Um, and I quote, he said, family and surroundings are quiet. He lives in a better portion of Rocinha, but he's still Rocinha, okay, it's not the kind of thing we see here behind the, ourselves on the screens. So he said, family, so family and surroundings are quiet, excepting my dear mom, minha mãezinha, on account of panic attacks. I am now writing from a hospital with her. Rocinha is calm, all wearing face masks, no agglomeration, and the local health unit is busy. So there's something there that, that maybe in the end will drive the day. And, and I hope this also leads to a political, to political change, lo and behold. Now, as far as the policy response that is part of the question, I, the first comment I, I, I must make is that we took a while to wake up and some people are yet to to recognize what is uh, what is happening, but after a significant delay, a formal state of calamity was uh, declared, uh, and some responses are now taking place. People from my tribe, I am I consider myself a fairly orthodox economist. I, I, we all went out. I think I went out very early to say, please, okay, this is a different story here. We must spend the temporary problem. We must spend. A lot. Where? Well, of course, we must spend on health. We need equipment, everything, face masks, beds. Um, we will need testing and tracking. We have very little of that. 
um, if you follow Worldometer, the site that has comparative data for countries, I, I follow that. Uh, I look, take a look at it every day. Brazil is by far the lowest in the world in testing. And we know testing and, and tracking is um, likely to be a, to play an important role. We have, virt we have basically not, nothing there. We must spend on, on social assistance. M many people are forced to stay home. Others have to stay home. Many are losing their jobs. So social assistance will be crucial. Uh, there is a program now in place that is utilizing the channels that luckily exist, the Bolsa Familia and the, and the, 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 the general registry, Cadastro Único for those who, who speak Portuguese. At least we have that. With that, uh, it is possible to reach probably about 75 million people. And now there's a campaign for more people to register. So probably be able to, uh, to reach uh, a, a, a large number of people the government has a program in place for three months, and I think they're gonna to have to triple the time minimum. Um, and so be it, it must be done uh, and, and it is getting done. And then there's a third dimension that has to do with uh, the, the world of credit. And there is a general paralysis. This is a very complicated technical uh, problem. Uh, the government has been struggling largely because the, this is not business as usual. Okay, so it's not like you're providing credit to, to a business that is uh, doing its thing. It, 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 it's, it's totally different. Many countries, as a result, have instituted direct grants. The U.S. has. And I've been advocating that here, but they, they, the government hasn't uh, come around to, to doing that. I think that must be done as well. It hasn't been done. Uh, Precious time was wasted here, as everyone knows, because our president uh, treated this as this is just another common cold in his and uh, and sadly people people listen to that. So social distancing is not where it needs to be, despite the survival instincts that I alluded to, and also because it's very hard to do social distancing in a slum, very very hard. Um, so this is an issue, and it will be with us for a long time, sadly, because in the end, without getting into too much detail, there will be no immunization. So we're gonna be back and forth until there is a vaccine. This is also pretty clear for most countries, in, I think, in, in, in the world. Um, to sum up, uh, and I'm, I'm getting close to the end. Um, as I said, we need a health strategy. We need an economic strategy and we need something on the politics. We do not have a, a clear health strategy to deal with this. This is a very major problem uh, for a lot of reasons, but I think it's important to, to single out the fact that Brazil is a complete outlier in this dimension. We have, we're, there's no relevant company in the planet doing what we're doing. Moreover, uh, our uh, public health system uh, that was designed after the British system it exists and does a terrific job, but they are massively underfunded. And I guess we've known this for a lot of a long time, uh, uh, but uh, you know, I guess it never um, occurred to pay attention to this. To I guess the power, the powers to be, the overall economy. Um, Despite the fact that I believe in the end the government will spend six percent of GDP, not a small amount, in the end, um, I, I think we're going to see a massive drop. I am not um, uh, in the astrology business, as uh, my colleagues in the social sciences like to say. One is present here, but I think we could have a drop in GDP of six, eight percent. Very hard to predict, but it could be worse even. Um, and um, as a result of the drop in GDP and the growth in government expenditures, and, and there'll be a decline in tax revenues because the economy is collapsing. We're gonna run a very substantial uh, budget deficit. And so our debt ratios are going to up, go up a lot. So the question is, is this manageable? And I think likewise, in, in, as, as we have in health, I think in, in the economy side, we don't quite have a plan. 
I mean, there, there are conflicting views. It's been difficult to execute. There are a lot of ideas, but they never get done. A few things have gotten done, but, uh, but, but you know, we, we need more. Um, I believe this situation is manageable, provided these expenditures are not permanent. We can't afford to do this every year forever. And so we need something, as we would say here in Rio, beyond the, where the, the waves break, we need to see calm waters. And, and this government hasn't been able to provide that. Um, and the overall political scene has been difficult. I, I, I think to, to the extent that Congress has been able to keep doing things, I think they deserve, uh, they deserve credit, but not uh, the, the executive. And the fact is, and I don't think the folks are going to start spending unless they see the, the light at the end of the health tunnel. They, we need that. These two things have to happen together. They will not happen independently. People are just paralyzed. But they're going to have to see something. And at the moment, we, we don't. Um, the whole thing will require, in the end, uh, uh, you know, good policy making, discipline, competent reform effort. In many dimensions, I've spoken at Princeton recently about some work I've been doing on inequality. I think that's crucial more than ever. Uh, but uh, the current political scene, as I see it, if I understood what Angela said, is, is incapable. It makes this impossible. So it's a, it's a very complicated situation. Uh, Marcelo Medeiros, who's visiting, um, Yesterday, in another event, I think summarized it beautifully. He pretty much said, social responsibility requires fiscal responsibility, but fiscal responsibility only makes sense if it aims at social well-being. I'm translating his wonderful wording in Portuguese. Um, and I, 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 I buy that. I've always bought that. Uh, and, and, and but I think he put it very nicely. So I conclude by saying, you know, we are in a, uh, in a perfect storm. All, all three ingredients must be addressed at the same time if we're going to overcome this immense challenge. And I, at the moment, I, I don't quite see it anyway. There you go. Yeah. No, no, you know, no hope at the moment that maybe moment. something will material. But, uh, but um, as Sirfin would say, we need an empirical lantern. We need to, um, you know, try to at least understand some of the <clears throat> dynamics um, um, without, you know, which, <clears throat> which make somehow irrelevant some of our previous notions of conceptions of the economic, the political, and the social. And against this bleak scenario, we will invite um, Alessandra Rufinov, who is known for her innovative work in the in the field of social activism, civic mobilization, right? You have been working uh, at the center for, for the past decade in organizing people's communities throughout Brazil uh, towards, you know, some policy change, you know, using online tools, you know, how do you see this kind of activism being affected by the pandemic and then by the Political and economic meltdown that uh, that Angela and um, and Armenia you know laid out for us. You know what's happening to social mobilization now, and where do you see it going? Well, thank you for your question, Joel, and thank you everyone for for being here. It's an honor um, to be accompanied by such high caliber people. So, uh, really a pleasure. Um, with regards to social mobilization, I think the first thing to say is that um, civil society in Brazil is responding to this crisis and it has responded quite quickly. I would dare say that it's probably responded more quickly than the state, which um, is um, saying a lot. Um, I mean, you made a reference to the emergency basic income scheme that has been implemented and that will is already benefiting um, a few million people in Brazil. We don't have the official numbers yet, but we estimate at least 50 million people. Um, and that is something that wouldn't have happened probably in the same way were it not for the efforts of organized civil society and social movements. Um, of course, they were not the only players um, that made a contribution to the debate, but, but it was an important contribution nonetheless. Um, so I do think that this moment is, is not one of 
um, we, we haven't really seen the many weaknesses of the sector at play. Instead, in, in many ways, um, we have seen the strengths come, come out and, and, and a strong civil society that is able not only to pressure government, to pressure for policy, but also to articulate policy ideas, do research, um, look for relevant data, and point uh, to possible ways out. Um, and that's, that's a good role for civil society to play. But of course, as an activist, I know that the main enemy of social mobilization is not repression, it's not um, difficulties along the way, but it's lack of hope. When people stop believing that any sort of change is possible um, in the world, in their communities, in their, in their country, it's really hard to convince them to move for and to take action. Because of course, taking action requires time and effort and energy and everyone is making calculations around the investment of time that they're making around something. And if the upside just isn't there, people are not going to do it, right? So the fact that we are living through such a difficult moment politically is a big challenge for activists because this disconnect between what people are advocating for, the tragedies that they're seeing around them, uh, the difficulties that they're already facing in their daily lives and those sort of policy responses that they're um, that they're seeing on the other side, that disconnect over time can make it really hard for activists to do their jobs and to actually convince people to, to uh, come out of their shells and take action on things. Um, so a lot of people think that when people are desperate, that's when the, the, their energy is more easily channeled. That's not actually too, true. Desperation, and we have a lot of research to back this up, and also from empirical um, uh, you know, um, experience, I can say, desperation is not a good friend of activists. Um, and this is a moment for many people of desperation. So that's something that we need to sort of uh, acknowledge. And, and, and as, we make, as we design strategies to keep people civically engaged, which is crucial to the health of our democracy, uh, we need to know that that's going to be a big challenge. That's going to going to be one of the biggest challenges that we have. So that's one thing. Another trend that I'm observing in terms of where um, social mobilization is at right now is um, it's perhaps more subtle, but it's something that I think would be interesting to share with you all. Um, it's this sort of idea of uh, universal policies um, getting a lot of steam and a lot of strength in the wake of uh, of this crisis. Um, for a long time, uh, many social movements have been more focused on um, essentially working in very targeted ways to help the poorest among the poor. And that has translated into uh, policies that are very, um, that have focalization at their core, gaining a lot of importance in, in the public sphere and in, in debate amongst public opinion. Um, however, what we're seeing right now is a level of downward social mobility that we have probably not seen in a very long time. A lot of people who were up until two months ago considered relatively well off relatively to sort of the social pyramid in Brazil are now facing real struggle, um, the possibility of just not having enough food on the table tomorrow. Uh, their families m must might have, uh, you know, all of the, the adults in the family might have uh, lost their jobs. Um, that kind of struggle that essentially pushes a whole bunch of people who were considered or at least like to see themselves as being middle class uh, back into poverty and fast forwards that downward social mobility just makes it a lot harder for policymakers to even understand who needs help most. So again, I think the, uh, the emergency basic income scheme is a good example of that. One of the provisions in the law that was passed in the Congress, um, one of the criteria for accessing that that um, I'll see new of 600 reais per month was that um, your family income in the year of 2018 uh, could not be um, above a certain level. Um, however, of course, 2018 was a lifetime ago, especially when you take the circumstances, the specific circumstances of the pandemic into consideration. Even December 2019 was a lifetime ago. Things have changed for families very quickly under just the space of a few weeks. 
So the kinds of instruments that policymakers usually use and that social movement builders, builders also use to ensure that the policies that they are pushing forward are really targeting the people who need it most, they're just very inadequate in this situation. And what I have seen, speaking to other activists, talking to people who are leading social movements, who are leading civil society organizations, is that the idea that things need to be more universal and more universally accessible, that idea has gained a lot of strength. I think one thing that has also contributed to it is just acknowledging how hard it is to even um, understand who is who and where people are at in the situation. I think in a few months time, maybe nine months, maybe a year, when we have a little bit more perspective on what has happened in Brazil this year and the consequences, the long-term consequences of this crisis uh, for Brazilian families, that's when we really understand uh, how badly actually we're probably targeting our policies right now. Because we're essentially, we took a picture two years ago and that's the picture that we're using to understand who needs help in a situation that is so dynamic that every day makes a difference. And again, I think for activists, that's also a challenge because our entire language, our entire methodology for activating people, the way we reach people, all of that is changing daily and it needs to change daily to reflect uh, such a dynamic situation. So it's a challenge for all of us. I could of course speak to other challenges the country is facing, but I think Angela and Aminu have done a terrific job of doing that already. And I don't, I don't need to repeat what they've said, but speaking as an activist and from that perspective, one thing that I think is hardest right now is even having a correct assessment of what needs to be done and for whom, which is why I think that this sector is probably gonna speak more about more blanket social policies that can help people in different situations, different moments in their lives and, and capture the, the, the dynamic aspect of what is going on uh, more easily. And finally, I think a third dimension of what is happening, of course, is this possibility of even more democratic erosion. Um, and the many, many signs that the executive is giving us um, of not wanting to engage democratically um, in, in this current context. And of course, for activists, that's particularly worrisome uh, because activists can only thrive in situations where there's a certain level of democratic openness and maturity, which of course Brazil had conquered after many, many years. And now it seems very fragile. I don't think we are in a situation yet where every activist needs to be very worried, but a lot of them are. A lot of them have been for a longer time. This is not just an effect of the pandemic or the current political crisis. We are the country that kills the most activists in the world, the democratic country. Um, however, the current situation of political instability um, and, and, and the fact that uh, supporters of the current government are essentially armed in many ways. Um, they have more access to guns than people on the other side. I think that just creates a kind of tension in the public engagement sector that I personally haven't seen, at least for the, the as long as I've been working in this, which is almost 10 years now. Um, and that's, I think, a new element as well that we have to take into consideration as we think about social movements uh, in this particular moment in time. Uh, yes, so, so if I can do like a little bit of a wrap up follow up is uh, so like both Armenia raised the point of, you know, like we, it's hard to think about the economic response without knowing what's in the political future. And Alessandra pointed out, you know, there's a risk of, you know, democratic backsliding, you know, the, the democratic institutions of Brazil eroding at this moment. So I want to use this to ask Angela to get a little bit into the astrology business, even though those are predictable, predictable times. And uh, ask her, uh, so perhaps there are like three possible scenarios for the Bolsonaro government. Right? An impeachment will happen. There could be a severe or more severe democratic backsliding, a military coup or something like that. Or the, his presidency just continues through a strategic collision with the judiciary, the center-right members of Congress or the Centrão for the, as they're commonly called in Brazil, and the military, which are playing a bigger and bigger role in, the, in politics these days. So I ask a little bit is, what do you see as the most likely political scenario, right? What is the most likely think, uh, scenario think will happen? And uh, uh, which kind of alternative politics is possible, right? For the, those who don't want to see democratic backsliding or people on the left and center left who are not represented in the current government. Uh, 
Yes. So like Arminio remembered, I don't like astrology and I distinguish my job from the astrology. Um, and, and as I said, I, I think we have the situation that any prediction is harder to, 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 to be made than in usual times. Because how you, you do, you, you build scenarios, you take the lines of actions that are more probable in, that have been occurring. And now nothing is even, um, well, everything is surreal in a, in a certain way, right? We are all living in, in, a, in a scenario that's very hard to define. And so one thing that I, I would bet to, to do and to try to answer at least a little bit your, your question is that uh, Bolsonaro is uh, looking to, to keep uh, his own supporters alive with him. So I don't believe he's gonna downsize the kind of discourse he has been doing. I think he's he's gonna do exactly what he has been doing. So uh, one in uh, one day he he attacks, the other day he goes a, a step back. So it's kind of game uh, with many different actors, but constantly. Uh, the other uh, political actors uh, seems to be a little shy to act against him because of pandemics. So outside this, this, this pandemic crisis, maybe an impeachment could go on. But now I think all our hopes, because for me it's a hope, uh, is in the, the Supreme Court. Because from there can come something to um, at least prevent him to go further in the direction he is he is taking. And as for the, so I think we we are living in a serious and dangerous situation, and democracy is at risk right now. When Bolsonaro came to power we could say, well, we have an authoritarian president, and, but the institutions are all stable and working. But now we are in an exceptional situation, and even democratic countries like France, for instance, uh, have now the parliament almost closed, you know? So why uh, this just cannot happen here? So I think we are living in terrible times. So, so if I can jump in and maybe ask then um, Armenia and Alessandra to comment on that too, you know, this, the, this, um, this difficult moment, you know, with the, not being in the business of predicting, but trying to understand, you know, the dynamism of the field and, uh, and where the limits are of our analytics. You know, uh, Angela in her comments uh, ended talking about the role of the judiciary. And Armenia mentioned that the Congress had kept certain things going or certain level of sobriety to a certain extent in, in, in understanding certain measures and being open to reverting certain policies, etc. So I wonder how Armenia and Alessandra are seeing this scenario that, uh, that, uh, that Angela painted and the role of the judiciary as well as being more engaged and, you know, if one could say judicializing the political domain. I mean, you, you sure don't want to go first? Okay. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, this is a tough one. Um, here's what I think. I think that, um, I think Angela and I mean, are best positioned to speak to some of this, but I think there's one aspect of this entire scenario of democratic backsliding that oftentimes gets forgotten in these debates. And it's the nature of the followers that Bolsonaro has harnessed. When I referred earlier to the fact that he his followers have guns, what I mean is I don't I no longer believe that Bolsonaro has a majority, and there's a polling data to back that up, a, a majority of public opinion behind him. He does, however, have the almost entire 
population with guns in Brazil behind him. The police forces are by and large supporting him. Uh, the armed militia are by and large linked to him. Uh, the sort of sport or um, you know normal citizens who have access to guns, of course, have historical links to his platform. He has has been speaking publicly um, on this issue of sort of making it easier for people to have guns for many many years, and has of course through that harnessed the support of that of that group as well. Um, and it is unclear to what extent the army is behind him. He claims that they are. And I think that the fact that his vice president, Moto, right after the latest display of um, anti-democratic um, behavior by the president this weekend, then came out on Monday to say that Bolsonaro was right and that the judiciary is overstepping their limits. It's very worrisome, not so much because of the content of what Moto said, but because of the timing. It is one thing to say that the, that the judiciary is overstepping its limits. It's a very different thing to say that 24 hours after the president has participating in a protest that essentially calls for closing the Congress, closing the judiciary, and for uh, a military intervention. So I think that right now, the, the thing that worries me the most is that regardless of whether or not the institutions are ready to resist, I think they're all the, the people who are operating these institutions are all making a very calculate, a very um, difficult assessment of risk, a very diff difficult calculation, which is, should we respond? Should we be effective as institutions? Should we show this president where the limit lies in democratic life? Because if they do that, if they show the limit, if they call their, his bluff, then we'll know if he's bluffing or not. And I think everyone is a little bit afraid that he may not be bluffing. That if impeachment procedures, for instance, gain a little bit more, more, more steam and actually become a real possibility that he will react through a coup or through other measures. I think everyone is a little bit afraid of essentially showing the full strength of their institution, uh, of their sort of institutional uh, capabilities, even within relatively healthy institutions. Um, and that's, I, I think an important part of the dynamic um, that we can't just neglect. And even if the institutions do do their jobs, and even if Bolsonaro never officially declares anything, a coup or anything like that, um, we could have a situation similar to what happened in Bolivia, for instance, where the army just sits back, the police forces do the dirty, the dirty work, right? Like we have other possibilities here. I, Again, much of the, the data that I have and the information that I, that I look at as an activist comes from other activist networks. And what I see um, is in, in social media, in other platforms, is this very dangerous uh, coalition of people who are armed and ready to take action on behalf of their president even without their president necessarily needing to give a very clear command. There's dog whistling going on, right? Bolsonaro doesn't have to say something with all the letters for people to understand what he means. And, and I think the danger is that if he, if he you know, blows the whistle with a little bit more strength, which is hard to imagine, he's already blowing the whistle quite, quite forcefully, but if he takes one step further, then that those very, um, unorganized forces that don't necessarily follow a very clear hierarchy, but that are listening, actively listening to him, that they might take matters of their own hands. And if that happens, then we might have something different from a coup, something different from a sort of classic, but we could even have civil conflict. I don't think that's out of the question. Sorry to be even more pessimistic possibly than my fellow panelists, mm -hmm. but there you go. Well, yeah. Armenia, do you want to add some thoughts? Sure. Um, I, a couple comments. One, I share all the, the fears and um, and doubts really in the end. But um, I think it's early in the crisis. Uh, and I think it won't take it won't take long before we see the very dire consequences of uh, policy choices that have been made um, 
I am of the impression that Bolsonaro is trying to pin the blame for the recession on those who pushed for um, policies of, of social isolation and so on. Um, but I, I think he missed the other side of the equation. And I also don't think um, in a world where Italy, for instance, the, the expected decline in GDP in Italy is double digits. So it's over 10% drop. I think you're going to have this all over the world. And, and um, I'm not sure this will do well. I believe uh, uh, Bolsonaro has, must have lost all the folks who voted for him because of Moro and uh, the crusade against uh, uh, corruption and whatnot. Uh, those are gone. At this, at this point, a, a vast number of people voted uh, uh, for Bolsonaro just because they didn't like the PT. So I, 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 my expectation is that the, the support will dwindle. Uh, and then we'll see. And once we get to that point, the issue is there, there are issues of very basic uh, power, power and violence, as uh, Alessandra uh, reminded us. Uh, but there is the army as well. Uh, there are the military, I should say, because you also have the Navy and the, and the Air Force. And they all play a role. And my hope uh, is that they will, will play a constructive role in, in drawing some limits uh, in support of the other branches of, of government that are themselves with all kinds of nuances, but in a way putting up, uh, beginning to put up a fight. We have seen in the other impeachments we've had in Brazil in the last three decades, I've been studying them, uh, similar behavior, trying to um, obtain votes in a number of different ways. Um, I'm no political analyst, but I, I think our center is not really an ideological center. They're pragmatic in, in what pragmatism has that is bad, but also there are survival instincts. And I think it's pretty clear to me that things cannot stay as they are or even get worse. And so my main hope is that we will, we collectively will put up a fight um, and will prevent this from diving into the abyss. How exactly it will play out, I don't know. I am hoping that we will move towards a country where the rule of law means something. And, and I believe we shouldn't be afraid of taking that uh, to to the limit, um, but it's it's too early to uh, to tell exactly what that limit will be. It depends on too many things at this point. I, I'd rather not uh, guess too much. It's very foggy beyond uh, a few feet. Okay, that's where that's where where we need you know critical thinking. And, um, and and a doing of sorts, you know, some kind of innovation as well in that moment. And I think we we are approaching the, the end of this hour where we want to really to to probe, you know, the, the brains of these wonderful public intellectuals how they are seeing this dire moment in in, in Brazil, you know, society, its people suffering from the pandemic and this and this complicated political and economic crisis. So so we. We want to end with a final question, you know, in that in that spirit of you know harnessing your empirical lantern, you know, to think this complicated in in movement, you know, dynamic uh, uh, present with um, with uh, without uh, clear concept and analytics, and at the same time without the guidelines of how to act necessarily politically, right? As as Angela Alonso reminded us at the start, you know, for this final round. 
we would like to ask you then to shine your lanterns on possible futures. So, so this is a domain of speculation and imagination, which we believe is a, is a crucial dimension of, of human existence, social existence, and of political work as well. So we know that it's not going to take, um, that's going to take much more than vaccines and treatments and local interventions to remake the, the world of post COVID-19 as some of you have written in your, in your wonderful, you know, you know, public columns, you know, for Sao Paulo and other and interviews and blogs, right? So it will take much more than vaccines and treatments and local interventions to, to, to remake uh, uh, this world's post COVID-19. So, so what's needed to keep Brazilian society safe and thriving. You already alluded to this here and there, but I'd like to take this moment at the end to hear your thoughts. You know, what's needed to keep Brazilian society safe and thriving, and which role the state will have to play, and uh, which social and political pathways will help to crystallize this greener, healthier, and more just commons that we hope for this land of ours. We are all ears. Um, I think we need the democracy and welfare state. So those things are crucial to everything in, in the future and none of them are for, for sure by now. I think in one way we have um, this treat that Bolsonaro and Bolsonarists bring to, to democracy and um, although they all the time they, they talk that PT would bring Venezuela to Brazil, I think they are coming close to this. What they, they have in mind and the process they, they have been uh, doing are approaching them and us to Venezuela. And there is a, a risk as in there, that the social order collapse because people uh, cannot live in in a situation as extreme poverty and unhealthy and everything we are living. So there is a, a, a risk of, uh, like in Argentina, sometimes ago we have people going to the supermarkets. So it's, uh, just kind of. Um, riots, you know, become more frequent. And then, as Alessandro said, we can have all, not just the military and police, but also militias responding as well. So social conflicts can increase. And without a an, an welfare state, I mean, without giving money to people for more time and conditions of living better, I think this is a, a, a real possibility. And the other thing I'd like to, to point out is that uh, the elites, uh, the, the, the most rich people in the country, they still are supporting Bolsonaro. So impeachment is just possible if they change. Uh, the other impeachments, Dilma and, and uh, Collor, occurred just when those, the, the social class came to the impeachment coalition. And I don't, I don't see that occurring right now. And finally, I'd like to point out that we had this kind of American dream here, a middle-class society during the Lula's years. And now this dream is over. So anything we, we can consider for the future uh, has also to take under uh, account this frustration coming from people that were going up and now are backing, are, are going back to their original positions or even worse. That's a hard act to follow, but I, I, I do think in the end, we will have to reinvent uh, social democracy. I, I agree with that completely. Um, not just in Brazil, our case is a more extreme one, 
because of the dangers of, of us sliding towards something a lot worse, which are, are there. Uh, but yes, I, I, I do think we're going to have to um, to rethink a lot of things. I think the the hope has to to lie on on something I believe a very basic. If there is a hope, I think right now I, I I really don't see this government leading us out of this uh, perfect storm. Um, and so it's, it's time to play defense and um, in, in in many ways. And 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 I you see it uh, everywhere. Uh, the hope I have is that things are 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 so bad that I, I I hate to sound sarcastic, but I think there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, you know, in the end. Um, and when I see you know people getting engaged and you know young people like Alessandra um, and, and and many others. I, I think there is hope in the end. There's no certainty. Uh, there's no guarantee that we will succeed as a nation. We have been slipping for decades now. We had some good moments. But if you look back the last 40 years, there's been very, very little growth. Um, some improvement in the distribution of income, but we remain one of the most unequal in the world. People just have no chance. So I, I'm not, I'm hopeful also that they will figure this out and, and, and then something will happen along the way that will finally give us a chance to, um, to go back to the path I think we had in the sort of Cardozo-Lula years. I at the time thought we were gonna make it, frankly speaking, I really did. So I think it's kind of trying to figure out what, some some way to go back. Um, you know, I, I, I you have to wonder. You know, what is this government thinking? Really, I, I have. I wonder when they go to sleep at night. I say, well, what am I doing with Brazil? You know. So anyway, that's where I, I have a, a little bit of hope. Um, and uh, in, in in the end, it's sort of a. a instinct of survival um, and it's not easy being in government when things blow up usually you get you take the blame and then a solution comes and uh, that's those are my my final words thank you well again tough acts to follow I agree with, every, with what's been said one thing that I would add though is that I think that this pandemic is a, a lot of you know comparisons with wartime efforts have been made, and I've I've heard more than one person refer to this pandemic as sort of our generation's World War II, and that everything will change after it. And I don't think it is really our World War II. I think it's more of a balloon ensayo, more of a, a a testing ground than the real thing. The real thing will be climate change. That's you know we're gonna see external sort of shocks like the one that we're seeing right now hit us time and time again for the next 50, 60, 70, 100 years. And that's just gonna be a new normal. And we're gonna have to deal with the consequences of these external shocks, maybe not in the exact same way. I think the very global nature of a pandemic, climate change will affect different places in very different ways. Um, so it, it may not be as uniform um, but I think that's going to be um, our reality. We're entering the age of existential threats and they're not going to go away. And if that's our premise, I think that, of course, democracy, of course, a welfare state, that's the very bare minimum to face the storm that quite literally the storms that are ahead of us. I think going even further than that, um, I think the main sort of currency of life is going to be risk. And who is taking the most risk in their lives? Uh, at the end of the day, when, when the storm hits, are you the person who is literally able to sit back in your house and order pizza? Or are you the person delivering the pizza? And I think that's going to be what divides us in, in very literal ways. So 
how do we create structures that essentially catch people when they fall a lot more effectively? And not just structures that catch them when they fall very low. I'm not talking about not allowing people to starve. That's a given. But how do we actually catch people when they fall even a little bit further you know, from that line? How do we ensure that people can remain safe and healthy and happy and then they're actually able to protect their own lives and protect their families and not forced into taking risks in a way that isn't viable for them. And if th there's very little chance of mitigating risks that can come in your life individually, unless you're a very wealthy person or you put a lot of what you make into savings, like you, you're sort of making all kinds of provisions for yourself individually. The only way that we as humans have really found uh, structures for handling risk is by making the pool of people who are sharing that risk larger. So at, at, at the risk of sounding too, maybe too um, theoretical, but um, I really do think that unless we invest a lot more in the commons, in those common structures that are available to all of us, in a public health system, in basic income schemes, in other universal public common based uh, structures of life that are available to people as they move through these very different situations and as they handle the, the shocks that will inevitably come in the next decades. Unless we put those into place right now, we are gonna see tragedy after tragedy. And that's gonna become very hard. And not just for the people who are hit the hardest, but for everyone. No one wants to live in a planet where people are dying by, you know, by the hundred thousands uh, for no good reason. So I think that's gonna be the challenge of our generation. And, in a way, if we take the lessons of this crisis seriously, that might just allow us to prepare for the real crisis that I see in the horizon a little bit better. So that's my hope. Dr. Mollis, you want to add a few final comments? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's again, the fact to follow and to wrap up. Uh, uh, so one small comment that as an economist, I, I just want to echo and agree with Arminio, but, he pointed out is this is 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 this question that there's a trade-off between the economic the, uh, growth and the health crisis and in, in a way there isn't right what the, what is hurting the economy is is the health uh, crisis right so uh, like fighting you know the best economic policy is to some degree fighting the disease right and that's kind of how we eventually gonna be able to get out of this uh, so if I want to wrap up a little bit like one kind of not so hopeful common theme, I think that there are three speakers said is, it seems like all of us are hoping someone will do something for us. I like, you know the military will keep the, you know, uh, 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 bigger conflict from happening. Maybe the judiciary will, will prevent democratic backsliding from happening. Maybe, you know, Congress will do the, the, the correct economic policy that the executive doesn't do it. In a way that's not very hopeful, it's, it's, it's these people in this group that we don't exactly know what are their, their strategies, what they're going and, and, and we're kind of hoping them to kind of keep things in the right direction for Brazil. So maybe in the medium run, things are very not hopeful for Brazil, but I think maybe building a mostly on what Alessandra said is there's kind of some hope for the future. Like maybe that is true. Like what the, the, the kind of in the longer run, we're going to live in this world where, you know, people are, are, are exposed to much more risk. And maybe the, the right way of doing this is envisioning a society where the risk is shared and things are universally provided, where the common public good is, is thought of. And maybe, you know, Brazil might be the place where no one has something to add, that is to end on a kind of hopeful note, like a, a, a colleague of mine contacted me this week. He's, you know, a researcher based in Princeton, and he said he's uh, helping uh, researchers at the Universidade Federal Fluminense to evaluate the uh, common basic scheme, a universal basic scheme in Maricá, a city in Rio de Janeiro. And he said, like, Oh, it's like a unique policy experiment. We want to study this. Maybe this will guide, you know, income, uh, universal basic income schemes all over the world. And it's kind of a nice thing to see. You know, there's one municipality like in a corner in Brazil was kind of leading the way at the global level, right? So maybe there's that too. Like when we look at Brazilian things are very worrisome. You know, maybe other spots in Brazil there's this kind of hopeful, right? Uh, yes. So that's that's wonderful, Tomas. You know, you're you're the way you're opening us to look for other to multiply our gaze, right? So so to 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 take the focus away from you know from from that 
entity that monopolizes and takes the oxygen literally out of the room and of the country, right? So it's kind of to multiply those, those sides. So, so, so before concluding this thought-provoking event, you know, Tomas and I want to thank the viewers at home for um, tuning in. Stay safe and keep engaging with the pressing issues raised by our panelists in your communities, in your works. And we hope you will keep participating in future Brazil Lab events. We also want to thank Mikaias Mugi and uh, Carol Dock for their incredible help organizing this event. And a heartful thank you to Angela Alonso, Armini Fraga, and Alessandro Rufino, our dearest friends, friends of the Brazil Lab, for your critically important work and vision and for your generosity of time and uh, insight. So take good care all and see you soon in another Brazil Lab event. Okay, take care, bye.